So, it's May 21st, 1999. It's a hot summer's day in Japan, and you sit down to watch the new Gundam show, Turn A Gundam. Not many people you know are watching it, which is strange, because you think it's pretty good. The Gundam itself looks a bit strange, apparently it's designed by some Hollywood dude, but the setting is fresh, the music is great, and the characters are pretty likeable. Like Loran, the protagonist, he's sensitive and human and nice. It's a surprisingly chill vibe for a Gundam series. Take the episode on today, it's all about a goodwill party between the Earth people and the Moon race. That's who the conflict of the show is between, though so far no actual war has broken out, which is refreshing. Anyway, Loran was mistaken as a girl by the enemy in a previous episode, and so apparently he now has to dress as a woman and take on the role of Laura to keep up the disguise. Oh right, that's why this episode is called Training to be a Lady. Okay, yeah, got it. That makes sense, I guess. And Huh. 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 This is, um... This is basically Force Femme, huh? So, what is Turn A Gundam saying about identity? I mean, if anything. With anime at this point in time, it's sometimes hard to tell when you're meant to read something like this thematically, or if it's just an element that's being pulled out of the otaku database to serve the market. As I've talked about in previous videos, the otokonoko was already popular by this point. The archetype had peaked in popularity in the 80s, but it was still something that popped up every now and then. So is that what this is? Just the staff picking out a popular moe archetype from the database and using it for Loran? Maybe, but at the same time, I think there is an ongoing thread in Turn A Gundam around identity and performance. You can see this in the opening, with different characters being presented in the background differently depending on how the character in the foreground perceives them. So since this guy is aware only of the Laura identity at this point, that's who he sees. Kihel knows Loran, so that's what she sees, and so on. Turn A as a whole is very concerned with notions of national identity as well. It's a story about a land that is being forcibly occupied by an outside culture. It's a conflict between the moon-based monarchy, who have been isolated for thousands of years, and a Victorian-esque Earth that has slowly rebuilt itself after a long-ago calamity. The moon race feel is their destiny to re-inhabit a land that they emerged from, but they are willing to displace people to fulfil that destiny. And their occupation, at least in its form at the start of the series, is dependent on violence. At the outset of the show, then, contestations over nationhood and belonging become justified and understood through categories of identity. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about how this theme is depicted with specific characters. One of the clearest examples of performativity in the series is the secret identity switch that happens between Lady Kihel Haim and Princess Diana Sorel. Princess Diana is the monarch of the Moon Race, and at least in theory, the head of their government. Kihel is a young woman from a respected and wealthy but essentially normal Earth family. And these two characters happen to resemble each other, physically almost identically. The switch between the two is one of the major motifs of the series, foregrounded in this image from the opening, Loran gliding through an endless sequence of the two girls. And what's especially interesting is that after they switch, there's no big moment of them returning to their original identities. They keep up the charade, until it's no longer a charade, until they have both successfully moved from one identity to the other, through a kind of performance. As such, it doesn't seem accurate to say that at the end of the series, Diana is actually secretly Kihel, and Kihel is actually secretly Diana. Rather, it seems that the series posits that Kihel was always more Diana than Diana was, and Diana was always more Kihel than Kihel was. Through performing the identity, they are that identity. What's especially provocative about this is that there's no initial decision to permanently alter that identity. The switch initially comes about as a kind of practical joke, but once in their new roles, they gradually shift their identity to the new position, just like the sequence of the two blurring into each other in the second OP. The episode where the switch begins is episode 10, A Grave Visit. And, well, basically I think it's one of the best episodes of any anime ever. Um, and for anyone who wants to make the case that Gundam is not about the mecha, but the characters, this is a perfect example. It's 21 minutes of tight character drama with no action scenes. Okay, so a little context for this episode. At this point in the series, the Moon Race have begun creating settlements on the Earth, and there's been some conflict with the Earth people, but no outright war has been declared. 
A very uneasy peace is at play, but it could break at any moment. In one of the battles that's occurred, Kiel's father died. Her mother has experienced a breakdown and is in a delusional state. Kiel's sister, Sochi, is deeply angry at the moon race. And it doesn't help that she has feelings for Loran, who she's just learned is also a member of the Moon Race, a spy who is turncoated and is now working for the Earth people. So she's all mixed up, basically. Kihel is very concerned about the situation, of course, but she's not showing the same level of anger at the Moon people. She seems focused on looking for political ways to calm the situation. On the other side, the Moon Race, Diana has grown up hearing stories about the Earth. She's glad to finally be able to be in the Promised Land, but she's also concerned about the effects that conflict could have on the planet. Furthermore, she doesn't seem to have complete control over her forces, who are itchy to reclaim the Earth and prone to conflict. So in the episode, Diana has a meeting with Kihel and other members of the Earth side. In an act of political brinkmanship, politician Gwyn Lineford suggests that they take a trip on an Earth airship. There's a clear goal here. Have the leader of the Moon Race see the damage being inflicted on the planet from the air. The damage that her politicians and military are likely shielding her from. And furthermore, humanize the enemy to her. Get her on side. A nice touch here is that Diana's advisor doesn't want her to go on the trip. And while he justifies this as being due to safety concerns, we as the audience know it's because he sees the political gambit being played here. So anyway, this is where the episode takes a turn. Before boarding the airship, Diana and Kiel have some time alone in Kihel's dressing room. Whereas Kihel is reserved and polite around a member of royalty from an opposing nation, Diana is relaxed and playful probably enjoying being able to socialize for once with someone who isn't a middle-aged male politician. They're trying on dresses, and at first, Diana appears to be simply suggesting different outfits to wear. Eventually, she has Kiel wear her uniform. The power dynamic is really interesting here. She has Kiel turn around so she can, quote, see what she looks like from behind. And when Kiel responds, you have seen yourself in pictures before, right? Diana responds, yes, but it's not the same as seeing the quote, real thing. So the performance of Kiel as Diana here is more real than a photograph of Diana would be. <laughs> as this scene goes on, it starts to become clearer that Diana has probably planned this whole thing from the moment she entered the dressing room. But primarily, they're both just playing, enjoying a game. Still, it's Diana at the end of the scene who commands, from this moment on, Kiel will be the real Diana. Okay, so quickly, I need to get into the B-plot of the episode. Sochi, Kiel's sister, is, like I said, conflicted over her hatred of the moon race and her feelings for Loran. She gets a call from her family maid, who tells her that her mother is deteriorating and to please visit. So she and Loran board the airship and convince them to stop off at the Kiel family home on the way to their final destination. Aboard, Diana and Kiel coach each other on how to perform their new roles, and they mostly do a good job of it. No one suspects that the switch has happened, even when Diana, as Kiel, momentarily can't hide her amazement at seeing the planet Earth from an aerial view. But then the episode takes an emotional turn. Quote unquote Kihel is asked to privately speak with Gwyn and Sochi. Gwyn wants Kihel to give Diana some clothes to borrow so she doesn't stand out when she's in town, and Diana readily agrees. <laughs> Sochi snaps at her sister for seeming so upbeat and excited. She chastises her. Why be so happy around the leader of the enemy? She reminds her that her father died because, quote, that woman decided to come to Earth that she's the reason their mother lost her senses. And this small moment here is really, really great. Loran tells her to understand, and Sochi responds, but I'm right, aren't I? And Loran responds in a very soft and delicate voice, yes, you're right. Sochi is grieving. She needs space to grieve, but because of the political situation they're in, because of the power imbalance between them and the moon race, they have to keep up appearances. And so Sochi can't make a scene. She has to quieten her emotions. She has to let the grief and rage simmer because they are doing everything they can to get the princess on sight. We can't have Diana in the next room, queen of a people that could wipe out the earthlings with ease, if she pleased, hear an angry outburst. Diana, as Kihel, doesn't have any melodramatic internal dialogue here. She's probably not surprised by any of this, I'm sure, but experiencing it in person is different, and what was initially a game has suddenly shifted towards intruding on the most extremely personal circumstance. But then, 
This is exactly the kind of story that her side's actions have created a hundred times over. This, however, is not the emotional climax of the episode. So the airship finally reaches the Kihel family home, and the group disembarks. They visit the home, and Kihel and Diana still have not switched back. And at the climax of the episode, Diana witnesses the grave of Kihel's father, and this is such an interesting scene. Initially, we get Kihel's brief reaction of seeing her father's grave. Kihel has always been emotionally reserved. Whereas her sister Sochi is outspoken, hot-headed, and tomboyish, Kihel always maintains a sense of repose and control. We get the sense that as the oldest daughter, she was probably being groomed to be the next head of the family. She's had to learn social grace, as well as being expected to continue the success of her family name, continue climbing the ladder. So she's never been able to have emotional outbursts. Even if she wasn't disguised as Diana here, she probably still would have restrained her emotional reaction. And then this is the emotional climax of the episode. We cut to Diana as Kihel running towards the grave. Director Tomino even does something I've not seen him do that often here. It's actually something that Osamu Dezaki does a lot, where he'll repeat a visual action three times to emphasize it. Diana runs towards Kihel's father's grave, and she plays the part of the grieving daughter. Sochi is visibly shocked here, because Kiel doesn't allow herself to show these kind of emotions that she's now supposedly showing. But the end of the episode is Kihel's internal monologue thanking Diana for this display of emotion. And we get the sense as the viewer that part of this is that Diana is grieving for Kihel. She's displaying the emotions that the other girl cannot voice, would not allow herself to voice. And by doing so, she's helping her to grieve. So a performance what started as a game ends up evoking the emotional reality of the situation more than the quote-unquote real event would have. All of Tomino's Gundam timelines deal with wars over land in some significant way. This is one of the central conflicts of the Universal Century timeline, though understanding its full breadth requires delving into novel materials. It's easy to misread the setting as a simple war between Earth and space, but there's actually a more ambiguous relationship going on. Earth is an extremely contested area in UC. Some want to move off it entirely in order to allow the planet to heal ecologically, and they view those remaining as an elite class who embody greed and excess. Others want to resettle the Earth, and we learn in works like Halfway's Flash that there are communities who have done so, but they live in fear of the Manhunters, a task force who forcibly deport, and apparently even murder, so-called illegal residents. The question of how the Earth should be perceived is kind of the central ideological struggle of the timeline. You've got people who want to resettle it, you've got an elite class who want to privatise it, and you also have those who want it to be cleansed with a kind of holy reverence. The central question of UC is the Earth as a contested space. What should its place be? And one of the interesting things about UC is it never comes to a direct answer on which group is correct. There's no point where the issues of the timeline are fixed, and so it's really up to the viewer to decide which ideology, if any in the series, is correct. But I think Turn A expresses these themes of land disputes best, because all this information is well communicated within the anime itself. You don't need to piece it together from scattered moments in shows and novels. It also helps that Turn A makes a connection to land and claims on land its central subject, and we see the effect of that on our characters. From the outset, Loran and his friends are members of the moon race sent as reconnaissance spies to Earth years before the planned invasion. So they're aliens in a different world, but through them, we see how they become attached to the land. The series nicely places us in their perspective, by giving us a version of Earth that is mostly familiar with the occasional alien element, basically Victorian-era Earth, but with occasionally different cultural practices, like the coming-of-age ceremony in the first two episodes. And otherwise, there's a real emphasis on pastoralism in the series. Best AniTuber Hazel has mentioned how well the medium of anime deals with these sort of pastoral elements, and in turn A we can see the lineage of classic world masterpiece theatre series, many of which Tomino worked on in the 1970s. The episode Laura's Cow is free to tell a story about the Gundam wrangling a cow, which is great, but it's also a story about conflict over who gets to use land, the invading Moonrise forces or the Earth people, and what that land means to people functionally, culturally, all together. By engaging with that pastoralism, the series is able to illustrate the importance of place and location on a material level.
When you look at the arc of Tomino's works, there's a really interesting change that takes place. In his UC stuff, the stuff he was doing in the 80s and 90s, it's all about the space age. Space colonization parallels the characters embodying new ways of seeing and understanding the universe. Space is going to let people reawaken, basically, and become better, and it's expressed through this new age psychedelic imagery. But something shifts as his career goes on. In the novel Gaia Gear, the colonies are in a state of disrepair, and there's now a movement to actively recolonize the Earth. Or take g -Reco. In that series, after so many wars, Earth's population now essentially lives in agrarian fiefdoms, ruled over by an elite now centered in space. And this elite, while mostly seeming well-meaning, are themselves in a state of decay. Living in space for thousands of years hasn't led to the promised transcendent awakening. Instead, their bodies have deteriorated, they require technological implants to function. So in UC, space is an awakening, it's an ideal, it's a hope. In g -Reco, space is hostile. Earth is home, Earth is where the hope is, Earth is where humans can reside. Basically, if UC is that sort of Carl Sagan view of space, space is our destination, Earth is our cradle, space is where we're fated to be, then post UC Tomino works are more Bill Shatner having an existential crisis after going into space. Space. It's 50 miles thick, broke through, and all of a sudden the blue is down below and the blackness of mm. space. Now, space is interesting, uh, the universe lies there, but at that moment, in that big window, it was only black and ominous, and that was death, and this was life, mm. and everything else just stood still for a moment. I was overwhelmed with the experience, with the, with the sensation of looking at death and looking at life. And, and this, you know, what's become uh, a, a cliche uh, of how we need to take care of the planet, but it's so fragile. You, you, people say, oh, it's fragile. No, no, no. There's this little tiny blue skin mm. that, that uh, is 50 miles wide and we pollute it. And it's our, it's our means of, of living. That's and a... I was struck so profoundly by it. That... In turn A, we don't quite get the sense that living on the moon is leading to the sort of physical deterioration we see in g -Reco. And the moon cities, when we get to them in the second half, are beautiful. But it's not Earth. The cavernous structures and the pale blue light of the artificial sky make it clear. This is a construction. So it's not surprising when we see in the latter half of the show that resettling the planet has become the primary ideological framework of Moonrace culture. In UC, new type ideology becomes a kind of Rorschach test, a belief system that different people project their hopes and worldviews onto for good and bad. And for the Moonrace in turn A, the Earth has become something similar. All historical development now stretches towards the resettling of that pale blue dot. Lauren is an interesting character within this framework for a number of reasons. In fiction, and especially in genre fiction, it's very rare that we have a main character who is totally subsumed in an ideology that isn't our own. Stories are usually about relatable, individualistic figures who represent the audience's general perception of the world. They'll defeat the evil empire, they'll fight for democracy, etc. If they do belong to some very different ideological framework, usually their character arc involves them slowly moving away from that perspective, to something closer to how the audience sees the world. Um, side note, this was one of my disappointments playing the mostly very good game Baldur's Gate 3 uh, and romancing Lysel, but being disappointed that her romance has her becoming less of an ideological gift Yankee. And gosh darn it, I romanced her because she was a hot ideological gift Yankee. Um, regardless, Turn A Gundam is very different in this way. Loran is a member of the Moon Race, and the Moon Race is a monarchy built around an ideological cult of personality to its queen. We see from how Loran talks and thinks about Diana that the utmost respect for her has been completely ingrained in him, to the degree that anything other than holding her in the highest esteem is a kind of cultural taboo. When he learns that Diana and Kiel have switched places, he reacts with a kind of traumatic revulsion, like some awful transgression has taken place. <laughs> It's not necessarily a relatable experience for the viewer. It's the reaction of an extreme ideologue having their framework of reality shaken. But I actually think that's kind of the point. Like, I think that one of the functions of a character like Loran is to have someone who is clearly kind and good and likable, but who also belongs to a culture that is 
actually genuinely different from our own. Most of us as viewers are not watching the series within, you know, absolute monarchies uh, with a constant fixation on a queen. I mean, some of us might be in uh, certain decayed monarchies with a recently deceased queen, but, but anyway, for a character like Lauren, we can experience someone with a different worldview. Okay, so yeah. Identity is a theme in Turning Gundam. Identity tied to land through the conflict between the moon race and earth. Identity tied to ideology through Lauren's ideological upbringing around the Diana cult of personality. And identity is shown to be malleable through Diana and Kiel permanently switching places. But why is this theme also communicated through gender, through Lauren slash Laura? The episode in which Lauren first puts on the dress and becomes Laura has a lot of parallels with episode 10. Like that episode, there's a dress-up sequence in which one character helps another to learn a series of social codes. In this case, it's Kihel explaining to Lauren how to appear as a girl. The interesting thing about this sequence is that while there's the usual jokes about the difficulties of performing femininity, the overriding impression isn't that Lauren is this masculine figure in feminine clothing or that there's some crazy juxtaposition going on. Rather, Lauren isn't really heavily gendered either way beforehand, which becomes even clearer in this sequence. And so here he just kind of moves from a position of androgyny to a slightly more feminine position. Identity for Lauren is already fairly malleable, and is as much about how others want to perceive him as anything else. Which isn't to say that I think there's some grand intended thesis on gender in turn A. If you were to ask Tomino what the series was saying about gender or identity, I'm not sure he would have an answer. From reading interviews with him, he strikes me as a very instinctual creator, and when he does try to put his themes into words, I don't think it comes out very clearly because I don't think he's operating from that level. Which is to say, I'm not sure he even knows why he has some of the thematic fixations that he does. But I can tell you what it means to me. I think this is a story about the ways in which who we are is massively defined by things beyond our control. Where we were born, the family we were born into, the cultural practices we are surrounded by, etc. It's about how what we think of as fixed and solid and unique about ourselves is actually often just the result of millions of different little aspects of cultural context that we happen to find ourselves in. But Turney suggests that in that lack of self, there is a freedom. Because if we are defined by context, if we are less the result of some inner essence and more dependent on a situation, then that means that we can just decide to embody something else. So Lauren, as a kind of genderless figure, becomes another way to express that. We are all prisoners of our time, but we can make the choice to at least try to step outside of that, even if that means just embodying another personality, itself molded by its own culture. At least that's something. Anyway, too long, didn't read. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> you exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you.